Hey there, MSPs and IT pros. Welcome to another episode of the Rocket MSP Podcast. I'm your host, Steve Taylor. Today, I'm joined by Tom Lin, the CRO of Avpoint. Tom, how's it going, sir? Good, Steve. Nice to meet you, and thanks for having me on. My pleasure. So I'm I'm looking off to the side today, and I'm really sorry, guys. I, I've got some technical difficulties here in the studio, but the show must go on. So I'm looking at the wrong monitor to... <laughs> to just make this happen so um so you're tom, not just avoiding uh, eye contact with me huh yeah well yeah i'm, I'm making on eye contact with uh virtual you not not here like i'm supposed to so i'll do my best to look here like i'm supposed to Understand. Um, all right so tom why don't you do me a favor and tell everyone just a little bit about yourself yeah, happy to, Steve. So uh, I'm Tom Lin. I am the Chief Revenue Officer here at AppPoint. Uh, I've been with AppPoint now for the last uh, 18 years, and uh, I've been working in all different kinds of departments, uh, starting in sales, also dabbled in operations and marketing. Uh, and today, as the Chief Revenue Officer, I lead effectively our, our global revenue and go-to-market strategies, uh, and then the execution of those strategies through our sales teams, both the direct team as well as the channel teams. And of course, working with our marketing, uh, as well as our CFO on the finance side to make sure that we're hitting all the marks that we're supposed to hit. That's really cool. And uh, we were talking about this before we went live. Most MSPs don't have a chief re chief revenue officer. So, I mean, you know, like you said, the big ones do, but most MSPs aren't big, right? Most MSPs have, you know, 10 employees or fewer. So they're, they're lucky to have... A service desk manager <laughs> at, at that size, you know? So uh, the title for today's uh, talk is How MSPs Can Make More Money in 2024. And I'm dying to know what you have to say about that. I, I suspect it has something to do with your product. Yeah, absolutely. I think both uh, with and without our product, I think the uh, the future is very, very bright for MSPs. Mm -hmm. um, I think as you know, now post pandemic, we settle into a new norm of just working digitally, working from home, working remotely. There's a lot more and more things that the clients are looking for. And there's a lot of services, there's a lot of tools that MSPs can bring to the table for those clients. So certainly a lot of money to be made. Very nice. So let's talk about first, how MSPs should be making more money without your product? Sure. I mean, as I mentioned before, I think uh, first and foremost, it really depends on uh, what is the digital kind of workplace, um, you know, technologies that the MSP is providing, right? So hmm. in, you know, kind of the world we live in today, in the digital world specifically, clients will most likely center on either Microsoft technologies or Google or Salesforce or quite frankly, all of the above to help their employees um, accomplish whatever they need to accomplish in their daily tasks, right? So as MSPs that are looking into, you know, getting into this market, I would say start to create specializations, technical expertise um, within one of these genres or multiples of these genres of large scale technology providers to be able to offer additional services to those clients, right? How do you make, um, you know, Microsoft 365 easier to use? How do you secure it? Uh, how do you back it up? How do you make sure that people uh, maybe are using Google and Microsoft within the same organization are managed properly, permissions are governed properly? So there's certainly a lot of expertise that could be offered to a client uh, from an MSP perspective, because a lot of these clients um, don't necessarily have, as you said before, a large enough IT presence or want to build an IT presence to be able to manage and govern all of these things. And that's where MSPs can really come in and offer that uh, at, a, at a pretty reduced cost. Now you you brought up a term that I want to touch on a little bit. You you mentioned that uh, you want to make sure, sure things are governed correctly. So governance, risk, and compliance (GRC) that's something that's becoming quite the buzzword around MSPs right now. Uh, can you can you dig into that a little bit and explain? Because I think there are a lot of MSPs that still think oh, I'm not big enough, I don't have to worry about doing that for my clients or whatever the case, right? So can you just explain why all MSPs should be focusing on GRC type services? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, as you said, I think, you know, even the term GRC is not, 
it's not something that we we just invented in the last couple of years, right? I mean, it's been uh, going on forever, except I think if you dial back, you know, the clock five, 10 years ago, GRC a lot of times was kept in-house because the servers were in-house, the data centers were in-house. So MSPs and service providers may not necessarily think about that yet. But as a lot of clients are starting to realize, even when they move to the cloud, right? So today I'm not necessarily running a, my own data center in my backyard, but I'm actually running that in an Azure cloud, in an AWS cloud, in a Google cloud, or, you know, GRC is still just as important because you want to be able to govern access to the data that's there, right? The govern the risk exposure that's there. And a lot of clients don't know how to do that now that the servers are not within their wheelhouse anymore. So this is perfect opportunity for MSPs to step in and say, hey, we can help you govern that data that you've now, um, you know, dumped into Azure or dumped into AWS. You should be watching who is accessing that information. You should be caring about what is the records retention on that information, right? You should be caring about what is the disaster recovery um, that your, your cloud vendor is providing you on that information you're throwing into the cloud. Because all of those strategies are something that you used to do in-house yesterday when it's your own data center. But today, the cloud vendors may not be providing you the, you know, the level of, uh, you know, scrutiny that you actually once had. So MSPs can perfectly step in to make sure that all of their clients are satisfying all of their governance and risk needs. Hmm. Okay. So when I hear governance, I think of uh, this, this will show my age in a way I think of like server 2003 and just, you know, using file permissions. I mean, isn't that essentially what we're doing with, with cloud governance today is we're, we're just setting up effective permissions. So that way, um, I don't know, everything's the, the least accessible necessary. I would say yes, uh, to a certain extent. Right. So I think, uh, again, maybe, in, uh, as you said, you're showing your age. What is file server permissions is very easy, right? Because it's centrally located. It's very easy to govern who has access to it. So at a file permission level, yes, it's very, very clear. Now, imagine in today's cloud world, specifically in, in you know our wheelhouse at AppPoint, let's talk about Microsoft 365, right? Mm -hmm. It's like taking that file server you were just talking about, multiply it 10,000 times, right? Now we have Teams and channels and SharePoint sites and OneDrive. And yes, every single one of those, including its subcomponents, have file permission style uh, needs, right? So, how do you then set file permissions across thousands or for some of our customers, tens of thousands of sites, tens of thousands of channels, tens of thousands of OneDrives? And especially with some of the newer technology that Microsoft is bringing out, additional environments are being created even without you knowing as you're creating teams. It's creating SharePoint sites on the back end. As you're creating SharePoint sites, uh, it's creating OneDrive folders on the back end. So a lot of times you don't even know where to look and where the data is located, let alone being able to manage the permissions on that. So I think one easy way to think about uh, governance or so the way we think about it here is imagine now, uh, you know, you have a, a wide piece of tarmac that you can park a thousand cars in, right? Otherwise known as a parking lot. Mm -hmm. uh, imagine if you had a parking lot without the lines and you just let a thousand cars in and say, hey, Parker, wherever you want, figure it out, right? You're going to park probably a lot less than a thousand cars than you originally intended, and you're going to cause a lot of traffic jams. So for us, by drawing the proper lines to make sure that people know where to go to find the things that they want to find, uh, one is going to encourage that usage a lot more because, you know, I don't know about you, if I'm trying to look for something and I go in there and I can't find it in 30 seconds, I'm creating a new one. Right. I'm not spending five minutes looking for what I'm looking for. So this is what we mean by, you know, enabling our users through governance, making things easier to find, making people, you know, sure that if I dump something in there, that it's going to be protected, that other people can find it and people I don't want access to it can't access to it. Right. All of that ideally done in the background without me physically aware, but I'm reaping the benefits of it. OK, I really love that analogy about the parking lot. That, that resonates very nicely for me. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, we, you know, another analogy that I talk to customers all the time and we use is, uh, and then this probably will show a little bit of my background. I, I, uh, I'm a pretty avid bowler. Um, so I also think about uh, bumpers on a, on a bowling alley. If you ever go bowling and you're not the most skilled bowler, um, the game is not as fun when you're throwing gutter balls every other ball, right? Mm -hmm. So what do you do? You put the bumpers on the side up 
And all of a sudden you can't ever throw a gutter ball, right? So for, for my young daughters, for, you know, people who are not great at bowling, uh, it makes the game much more fun. So imagine putting those bumpers around your users so that as they access, again, whether it's a Microsoft 365 or Google or Salesforce environment, they don't step into the gutter accidentally. It makes their game, it makes their digital usage much more fun and protected. Hmm. Very nice. Now, my ADD is, uh, is, is on overdrive today. So, uh, I'm, I'm just sitting here remembering 20 years ago, longer than that, maybe oh, when, uh, when I used to go midnight bowling with my friends and they had black lights and music and, oh, it was a good time. Sorry. Anyway. So they, they still do that now, by the way, I'm, I'm a pretty avid bowler. They still do that. It's, it's, uh, we call it disco bowling where, where, uh, you know, by the bowling alleys near me. Um, yeah, it's still, still a thing. Very good. Very good. All right. So, um, let's, let's talk about Microsoft 365 a little more because it looks like F point is, is all about Microsoft 365. And I'm sure you, I'm sure you guys work with Google too, but let, let's face it. Most MSPs work with Microsoft 365. So that's, that's where we should probably live for right now. Um, how how do you how do you actually govern Office three sixty five or Microsoft three sixty five whatever you want to call it? Well, we we approach it in a lot of different ways. So I think going back to even what I was mentioning before, um, even just a general term of Microsoft three sixty five encompasses a lot of different things, right? There's, yeah, there's right. Uh, Exchange, Teams, you know, channels within Teams, OneDrive, SharePoint. Uh, all different things. And I think one of the first um, kind of obstacles that our customers run into is, well, where do I go to do what, right? If I want to actually even go in and, and post something, do, that, do, I, do I do that in Yammer, which is, you know, today rebranded to Viva Engage, right? Or do I create a SharePoint team for that? Do I just create a, a, a channel or a Teams to discuss with my colleagues? You know, where do I even begin? Because there's so many different options of where I can post what I'm trying to post or communicate what I'm trying to communicate. So right off the bat, we can help clients create a strategy and enforce that strategy to say, hey, if it's you know going to be a something that you're gonna share with a person one-on-one, -on -one, maybe just share it through OneDrive. And we're gonna force that person down a path where they're not creating an, a new Teams or creating a new SharePoint uh, for the simple sake of just sharing one document with one person, right? However, if you're trying to make you know, company-wide announcements, department-wide announcements, maybe we steer that post towards a Yammer or Viva Engage, right? So even just mm -hmm. enabling people to to go someplace to do what they're trying to do is is a great start. And of course, um, there are so many things we can do beyond that, including what we just talked about, permissions management, you know, let's say making sure that people don't accidentally step into the gutter by creating, you know, let's say digital ex spaces that all of a sudden you don't even know it, but you're sharing externally. I create a team site for my department, my team here to share. Oh, and by the way, I accidentally clicked the button and all of a sudden it's a public site that, you know, partners outside the company, customers outside the company, all of a sudden have access to internal app point documents, for example, right? We can remove those, um, you know, landmines, so to speak. So you can never click on that button. Or even if you click on that button, nothing happens because we know, depending on your role, your department, your task that you're trying to accomplish, this should not be an externally shareable function, if that makes sense. It does. It does. All right. So, um, why don't you talk to us about what Evpoint is going to do for MSPs? Absolutely. So, a lot of the things that you know I mentioned before, in terms of that governance, in terms of directing people to do the right thing at the right time, and removing users' landmines so that they don't accidentally step in something they don't want to. All of those things we've been doing for our clients for many, many years, right? And what we did uh, about four or five years ago was take all of those capabilities and build it into a platform that is designed for partners and specifically with MSPs in mind so that they can then take all, all of those functionalities and behave as a single client to AppPoint, if you will, and then deliver it as a service to their end customers. So they're able to go in and offer services to clients to say, hey, I can be your governance strategy. I can be your enforcer. I could be the company that makes sure that 
all the users are doing all the right things and not doing any of the wrong things. And I can charge you based on number of user as a service, while back end of that is a platform is a tool that's powered by AppPoint. Very nice. Now I have somebody who asked a question. I, I think I can answer this for us though. The question is what differentiates AvPoint from CIS controls? And I believe you guys, uh, you, you may not show how you align with the controls, but, but AvPoint is a solution to help MSPs align their clients with CIS controls or NIST CSF or pick your framework or control set. Exactly. So I think you, you, you've answered that perfectly, right? So we are, I would say, one of the many tools that a client may choose to use, or you may choose to offer to a client to make sure that they're staying in line with something, but we're not built for any specific controls in mind, because depending on, again, the standards that they have to adhere to, uh, whether it's CIS controls, whether, you know, it's, it's NIST or HIPAA or anything else in any industry, depending on how the data needs to be governed, we can be one or uh, the only or one of many tools that you use to make sure that you're adhering to those controls. And with, I mean, CAS V8 has 18 controls, I think. And with those 18 controls, each one is broken down into some have like four sub controls, others have 13. So yep. just because you're doing something for control seven doesn't mean you're checking off all of control seven. You might just be checking off a, a sub control or, or whatever you call that. Correct. Now, it also, of course, depends on the fact of what it is actually, you know, again, from the data perspective, what you're storing, because again, we are not a, uh, let's say a company wide control uh, adherence as well, right? So we are very much so in the Microsoft space. So it really depends on, again, what, what processes, what data, what, you know, the company relies on their M365 to do. We could help govern that part, but obviously, if you have a um, big portion of your business that's in something else, let's say a, a, a homegrown application or, or outside of Microsoft 365, then we would not be the tool of choice per se uh, for that specific function. And that brings up a really good point because you know MSPs are a perfect example of we just sign up for here's another tool. Oh, look here's here's another tool, and. I think many MSPs don't sit and like analyze what, what am I, what am I opening up as, as part of this Pandora's box that is signing up for yet another tool? What, what now do I need to install as far as controls and frameworks on this product? Because people only think about setting up CIS controls on Microsoft 365, but they forget about setting it up for QuickBooks and whatever else, right? All, all the other things. Maybe they maybe they think about it for QuickBooks because money, but you know what I mean. Yep. So yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry. I don't know if you have a question or you want me to reflect on that. No, yeah, reflect, please. Yeah, I think for me, you know, one of the things that uh, MSPs and and certainly ourselves as vendors uh, try to do is we try to understand what the client is ultimately trying to achieve, right? A lot of times we talk about kind of that digital workplace enablement. The reality is even as a, as a software company ourselves, the technology can only be helpful if you know what you're using the technology for and what's the goal you're trying to accomplish, right? So when you go somewhere and the client says, yeah, I want, you know, A, B, C, D, E technologies implemented for me, um, it's a great opportunity to really sit down with the client and be that trusted advisor and say, well, do you need software A, B, C, D, and E, right? You know, B and D kind of do the same things. And oh, by the way, B and D could probably be replaced by, you know, XYZ software company that does two things or three things together, right? So knowing the goals and what it is that clients are trying to accomplish rather than just really take it from a technology perspective to say, oh yeah, we'll do three technologies or four technologies, I think is, is the right approach. And one of the things that I need to yell at myself about is I use 12 tools when I could use three because I like this tool better or this one's prettier or whatever, right? Like I, I complicate my own, uh, stack 
Yeah. And I don't, I'm not talking about the MSP stack. I'm talking about like the stuff I use for marketing rocket MSP and that kind of stuff. I complicate everything by not just using Microsoft 365 for as much as possible and adding a couple things on top of it to, uh, yeah. yeah. And, and listen, I think it's, uh, uh, it's very easy, you know, for you, um, and small companies to do it, but you'd be surprised how many large customers that we walk into, uh, that are still doing the same thing, right? So there's really no differentiating whether you're an SMB, whether you're a mid-sized company, large companies. We've walked into all sorts of clients where um, they're paying for the entire organization to have Microsoft 365, which gives you something like, let's say, one drive for free with with a, you know, a pretty large amount of storage per user. <laughs> and yet we will often find that they also subscribe to Dropbox or Box <laughs> on top of that, right? Or we'll have clients that, uh, you know, love, M you know, M365, they use Exchange, they use OneDrive, they use everything that it comes with, but then they'll go subscribe to Slack because, you know, for collaboration, we like Slack better, right? So there's definitely a lot of these um, that are out there regardless of company size. And, and again, for us, it's always, you know, sure, if, if uh, you know, money's not a concern and you just want to buy multiple technologies, um, go ahead. But you need to realize that a lot of the technologies you have are overlapping and perhaps you can actually consolidate that. And that's, you know, even without using technologies like AppPoint or any GRC type of software, if you can limit the places where people are at, that's already a GRC control itself, right? You know, if, if I'm finding some data over here in Slack and some other data over here in OneDrive, when everything could be in OneDrive, that's already a, a, a control limitation on its own. Hmm. So why don't, are you able to dig into the nitty gritty with how Avpoint works? I can. It depends on how uh, nitty gritty, how deep you want to go. As as deep as you want to take us, man. Um, I, I, I would say, you know, give, give us all you got. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, you know. Let's uh, maybe we pick a point and we, we you know dive deep down, right? So I would say uh, from an MSP perspective and how AppPoint helps MSPs, one of our biggest, uh, most common offerings that we provide is backup. And essentially you could call it disaster recovery services or ransomware protection services, right? So as clients put their data into 365 and it's spread across Azure, OneDrive, you know, SharePoint, everywhere you could put data, one of the things that they don't realize is what's the exposure of risk to that? So. What our platform allow MSPs to do is actually come in, do a scan, take a look at potential uh, risk where, hey, this is too exposed. Too many people have access to this information that probably should be considered confidential, right? Or uh, you have contents here that are not necessarily being backed up or stored properly. They might be considered records. Um, you know, if you're if your um, end user is a, a small law firm, maybe they have cases, uh, you know, docket numbers, things like that in there that probably should be retained as records and not just um, kept the same way as other data. If you're a small, you know, clinic, maybe a small hospital that you're, you're helping to, you know, digital enable them, maybe they have patient records in there that shouldn't, again, be treated the same way as other data. You can go in as an MSG using AppPoints tools, do a quick scan of the environment and prevent, you know, present that data back almost as a heat map, uh, to the client to say, Hey, you know, here's, here's what your digital environment or your digital footprint looks like. There are some suggestions that I would make. Maybe you want to do this, this, this here. And any one of those suggestions could trigger, uh, again, an app point tool and service that you can then offer as an additional charge um, to that client, right? Um, a lot of people, again, from a, a other aspect perspective of disaster recovery, they don't know that once you put the data into a Microsoft 365 environment, Microsoft only backs that up and keep it for a certain period of time. So let's say you lost something, you want to go back six months, one year, to, to recover a document that the, the CEO of the company that you're helping to recover is, you're going to quickly realize that that document doesn't exist anymore. The CEO got rid of it. If they deleted a location, a drive, a file a year ago, that's that's just gone, right? So you're able to then, uh, again, leveraging our tools, be able to bring something like that back and potentially you can offer it uh, as a charge to say, hey, look, every ticket, every recovery um, that we help you do is an you know, X dollar type of engagement, right? So there's a lot of things that you know, I think people, when they go to the cloud, they, they think it's set it and forget it, right? We're, we're in the cloud now. Everything is taken care of. All data is going to be available forever, always, and, and super secure. As an MSP, as a partner of AppPoint, you can go and offer to show the clients what they're missing, where they're missing, and how you can actually help them solve some of those problems before they even realize there's a problem. Now, 
in my ignorance, if we don't synchronize the files to a local device and we just leave the files on the cloud, they can't get ransomware, right? Uh, of course they can, <laughs> because um, they're not, you know, Microsoft's not not infinitely uh, defending everything everywhere all the time either, right? And quite frankly, even uh, a lot of what we see is where there's lots of data or ransomware, the leaks always come from someplace, right? The the days of where uh, somebody's actually brute force hacking in to get that data uh, is really the, the, I mean, you hear about it in the news a lot, but in the, in the, you know, statistics of cases, that's actually the super minority of the cases. A lot of times they're getting in through, um, you know, uh, somebody misplaced their, their password. Somebody put a, you know, password on a sticky note on their computer, for example, right? They're getting it more legitimately. And once they have the access into your systems, uh, whether it's through negligence, uh, or intentional, um, you know, bad actors, once they get in, they of course can ransom you, right? They can go in, they can change access permissions to that file. They can delete that file. They can, they can download that file and keep it. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's no different than, uh, again, you know, what you were doing yesterday, right? For me, the way that I always think about cloud is it's, uh, it's somebody else's data center, right? Yesterday, that data center you own, you run the data sits in it today. It's still in a data center, in a server sitting somewhere. You just call it the cloud because you don't own the data center, right? right. But effectively it's still a data center with servers and how they can gain access to it the first time is how they can gain access to it the second time. All right. Now I see on your, on your website, you've got a, a page just for Microsoft teams, admin and management. So why don't you talk to me about what F point does for teams? Absolutely. Uh, I would say we do the most comprehensive, uh, offering for teams across the board, uh, against any other kind of software provider that's out there. Right. Hmm. So starting from, uh, the provision of teams, right. How do you let somebody have the permission to create a team or not? Right. So even at the very, very inception of it, should you, you know, going back to what we were talking about before, create a team or not, right. We can say, what are you trying to do? Is this going to be, uh, fantasy football? Is this going to be, uh, um, water cooler talk, or is this going to be a departmental type of, um, you know, collaboration, right? If it fits certain criteria and doesn't fit into other criteria, we say, yeah, go create a team or don't create a team, right? So we're able to even at the inception control who can create a team, what a team can be created for, right? Once you do that, then of course we can put in automatic triggers for, well, we can classify this team to be internal, could be sensitive, could be confidential, or it could be public. It could be external, right? Um, depending on what you want to share and who you want to share it with. Subsequent to that, is this something that we allow you to create channels underneath, right? Or you can just collaborate on the team, but we're not going to let you create extra channels uh, or we're not going to let you create private channels, right? Some, some people might want to create private channels. All of these things where somebody may want to try to do something for a particular reason, we can govern from the inception of that um, to make it as smooth as possible so that, again, that entire process I just described is transparent to the user. Um, but on the back end, from an IT, from an MSP perspective, you already know that those things are created with the right permissions, with the right intention. Of course, we then track that entire life cycle of those teams all the way to the end, right? So one of the things that we see now is, especially if you have clients that are in teams now for a number of years, right? A lot of people jumped in on 2020 and went all in on teams. Now, fast forward three years later, thousands of teams, tens of thousands of teams get created. Nobody can find anything anywhere. You know, if I want to go to the, the team for HR collaboration, there's 45 HR teams, right? There's 45 sales teams that I somehow belong to. And where do I find that information? Well, we can start eliminate, help you eliminate things like duplicate. We, we can say, Hey, there's already things that somebody's already posting over here. Maybe don't create a new team. Or we come back on the reverse end of that and say, Hey, you now have all of these teams that barely get access. There's no updates. Nobody's posting anything. Nobody's accessing anything. Perhaps this is something that is slated for deletion, right? We can send out notifications to the team's owners and say, Hey, you know, Steve, you own a team. Nobody's visited it for six months. There's nobody clicking into it. There's no new data being posted. Are you sure you still want to keep this team active? Right. And by the way, if you don't respond to me in 30 days, we're going to go ahead and, and take a snapshot of that for the archive and then delete it from the active um, production environment, right? So you could going through that entire process, coming out the other end, maybe a year later, 
uh, you find that your 10,000 teams now are really just 200 teams that people use all the time, right? So anything from inception to managing throughout the life cycle, all the way to sunsetting teams, um, we can help clients do that. And MSPs can offer that as a service. And, and we not only do that for teams, we do that for uh, SharePoint sites, um, you know, a lot of the, you know, uh, entities within Microsoft 365. Now, with with all of this cool stuff that you guys are able to do for managing uh, and governing Microsoft 365, I want to I want to take the the Microsoft purist approach here for a second. Why can't we just do this from the admin portal or from Intune or, or whatever some some function built into Microsoft? You certainly can, you know, and we've been a Microsoft partner for 20 plus years now. And I've certainly, you know, in my 20 years there at AppPoint, uh, worked with Microsoft hand in hand. It isn't about uh, us replacing anything that they already offer you. In fact, um, you know, similar to what I mentioned before, as an MSP, as a partner in the Microsoft ecosystem or just a partner to AppPoint, um, you should be investigating a lot of those out of box functionalities uh, that you are servicing your clients with, right? It's really where the clients get to a point where they expect more out of the native solutions and the native isn't there uh, to support, you know, whatever the client's needs are that you start to investigate into options like us, right? And Microsoft does provide a native backup. Microsoft does provide native, um, you know, GRC capabilities up to a certain point, right? The, the model of Microsoft has always been build a giant partner ecosystem and, you know, they will go 80% of the way and the partners will help fill the 20% of the way to get to the client's 100. Now, for a lot of clients, if 80% is good enough, then 80% is good enough. You know, I'm, I'm certainly, uh, as a person, uh, you know, run, who run a business and is, is running a sales team, I would never tell you to buy something you don't need to buy, right? I mean, save that money and buy something else instead. So uh, certainly what we try to do is provide, in addition to the native, uh, not anything that would, would clash with what you can get out of the box. Okay. Now, are you familiar with CyberDrain Improved Partner Portal, CIPP? Uh, I am not personally. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's okay. So that is, um, I, and, and I'm, I've never used it, so I only know what, I, what I've heard and read. It is basically a Microsoft 365 management portal for MSPs that is open source and allows th us to... Uh, connect to multiple portals, all from a, a central dashboard. With with a platform like that, the you know it's something that is geared to generalist, if you will, not necessarily like governance. So, would would you say that these generalist applications may or may not be good enough for governance type work? Yeah, I mean, in a broad sense, yes. But again, going back to what I was saying before, it really comes down to what the clients are looking for, right? And I think uh, hearing you describe it, I, I think I, I kind of understand it. I've seen it before. We, we It's not something we use here internally because we don't sure. govern uh, multiple uh, clients, um, Microsoft admin portals, I should say. Um, but it is definitely a similar concept to what, for example, we offer in our platform, where if you're mapping, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of clients into the same interface, we allow you to one interface to set different, you know, governance per strategies, permissions, backup strategies across multiple uh, clients, M365 environments, right? It sounds like this is the, the Microsoft way, uh, standard way of doing it. So for me, again, if it's good enough, it is good enough, right? A gotcha. lot of times... Uh, as as a partner and quite frankly, as a vendor, it's really for us to educate and you'll see a lot of uh, our content on the web and including our blogs, including the webinars we run, it's really to educate the public, the clients, the partners of what's out there out of the box and what's not covered out of the box, right? So I think as partners, um, if you can go to clients and start to understand one, what the vendor provides, right? What's native out of the box, but also you can understand what the client's needs are then you can be very prescriptive to the client and say, hey, it's it's not enough, right? Native is not enough. We need this additional thing. So I wouldn't necessarily make a, a broad statement to say, hey, you know, out of box is not enough. It is enough for for a lot of people. Um, you know, I think um, to the point where 
you know, tools like what AppPoint could provide and even other, uh, you know, let's say competing vendors in the space, um, we're not at a hundred penetrate, hundred percent penetration of all Microsoft 365 users worldwide, right? So clearly, for somebody, uh, good enough is good enough. Now I see that on your Teams page, you offer uh, Slack to Teams migrations. How does that work? We do. So uh, as I mentioned before, you know, we are one of the uh, oldest uh, partners for Microsoft in this space. Um, you know, we. We really have been partners with Microsoft way before this concept of, of Teams and even cloud uh, was around, right? I mean, we've been around since effectively SharePoint 2001, uh, the on-prem version and, and on-prem for many, many years uh, before they even came out with the cloud. So we've always been a great partner of migrating clients into the Microsoft ecosystem, right? Back in the day, starting from file system migrations to a lot of legacy collaborative environments. We even do things like uh, live link, notes, documentum, migration into SharePoint. So as Microsoft really evolved into the cloud ecosystem, um, we just followed with our migration strategy, right? We do, um, you know, today people want to go to Teams as a collaborative platform. Well, where are they coming from? Well, a lot of times it could be on-premise, uh, SharePoint, on um, other Microsoft tools, which of course we migrate as well. But a lot are also coming from competing cloud platforms like Slack. So, you know, if an organization comes up to an MSP, to a partner of ours or to us and say, hey, Tom, I've been, you know, my organization has been using Slack for the last five years, but now I pay for M365 and I get teams for free, I want to move. Well, you can't just kind of, there's no, Microsoft doesn't give you a migration path. And of course, Slack is not going to give you a migration path and migrate out of them. So vendors like us actually provide abilities for you to move moving not only files, which is quite frankly, the easy part, but uh, moving conversations, moving, um, you know, I started a conversation, I tagged this person, or I inserted this file in the middle of our conversation, all of that integrity and fidelity of what's happening in a collaborative environment in Slack needs to be almost one to one move to teams, right? And we do that for our clients. Similarly, uh, we also do things like box, Dropbox, to OneDrive migration, right? We do G Drive to OneDrive migration. Again, if you're coming from alternative cloud collaboration technologies, and today Microsoft is your destination, we have something to help you there. And I think this is one of those things for your MSP audience that is very powerful because migrations almost always uh, need a partner, need a service provider to go in and provide that service, which is not something AppPoint provides, right? We are. We're a tools vendor, we're a product vendor. We're not going to be the one sitting there actually doing the migration for you. We, we rely on our partners very heavily to do that. And because of the expertise required to move cross platforms, this is where uh, there's a lot of opportunity for partners to go out and say, hey, I, I can do Google migrations. I can do Dropbox migrations. I can do Slack migrations, right? And that's a, a great way to differentiate themselves against other vendors that are out there to attract clients who are looking for that very specific thing of migrating from Slack uh, to, to Teams, for example. And of course, with a tool like ours, making that much easier, uh, simpler process. That is really cool. I I got to say, I thought you were you were going to tell me that it'll create the, the channels and assign the users permissions. But the fact that it migrates the files and the conversations, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. If it just... If it just creates the channels and the, the teams, that's just a provisioning tool, right? It's not a migration. Yeah. Not only does it do that, uh, everything we do from a migration perspective is full fidelity. As in, if there are uh, dates, metadata tagged to files to conversation, we keep all of that as well. Again, for, for a lot of our clients that are in regulated spaces, you can't lose that metadata trail either. That is really cool, man. And uh, this conversation couldn't have happened at a more... Uh, perfect time because our organization is looking at uh, leaving Slack and going into Teams because we're already paying for Microsoft 365. Why wouldn't we just use Teams? Exactly. Exactly. Well, hey, now you know who to call. Yeah. Well, I mean, I just put it in the suggestion box. We we should check out Avpoint and see if it's, you know, going to check all the boxes. What what does... You, you offer so many features, right? So... Um, how does pricing work for your product? Uh, most of our products are priced per user per month or per user per year. Okay. Uh, it's not, uh, we don't, you know, nickel and dime based on functionalities. And it's, it's actually, you brought up a good point. 
Um, I would say that we always try to overbuild because we we are catering to all sorts of clients, right? Whether it's uh, the client with five users or the client with you know five hundred thousand users, um, we want to make sure that all the bases are covered, and that's why we rely on our partners a lot because we don't necessarily expect our clients, uh, end users or end clients, to understand everything we do, right? But as a partner, because you're doing multiple engagements and you're using the same tool over and over again. So the clients are changing, but the tool isn't, and the, and the partner isn't. You understand a lot more about our products, uh, and you know every single functionality that's there, right? So it it helps you differentiate your offering. It helps you uh, become experts in our product, um, but it also gives it a very simple message to the end client because again, the end client doesn't have to know everything we do as long as the partner does. That's really cool. So I feel like I I got a partial answer. So I'll ask a more direct question. What do you charge MSPs? <laughs> so we, we charge MSPs the, the same way. So it's still a uh, price per user uh, per year. Of course, uh, we, um, you know, there's discounts in there that uh, you're not paying the end user price, right? So a lot of the things that we do is to make sure that, again, you know, from a picking vendor perspective, of course, one side is making sure the technology fits. But the other is also making sure that financially it is a viable thing for the organization. And that's why we do uh, work with our MSPs to do that. Um, we have, um, again, price per user per year, but we also do things like pool licensing, where you can buy uh, a pool of licenses in advance to assign to different clients as you see fit. Uh, and of course, we have volume based uh, licensing as well. So as you get into multiple clients, as those user counts start to stack up, you have tier pricing that the more, the higher the user count, the lower the per user cost is. Still not an answer. <laughs> oh, well, on that front, I mean, I think uh, you know, in in uh, out of respect for uh, some of our partners that are that might be on the call, it's not something that we publicly share. However, uh, if you were to sign up to be a partner at that point, you will get access to a partner portal, and all of our pricing is public to all of our partners inside of that portal. But we do not make that pricing public uh, that out sense. in the in the world because, again, we want to preserve our partner's integrity as they then flip around and offer that as a service to a client. We don't want the client to easily find out that information. But of course, as any partner of AppPoint, the moment you sign up, all of that information is public to you. That's fair. Is the, I'll call it MSRP pricing, something that you talk about? Uh, on some products, it is discoverable. It is, it is uh, to answer your question, no, we don't publish our MSRP on any products online. Okay. Um, uh, there are some that you probably Google hard enough to find because somebody else has posted it, but nothing from that point is public. Okay. Well, I tried. I tried, guys. I tried. <laughs> um, if you know where to look, uh, or I would say if you're listening to this conversation and you are uh, looking to become a partner of AppPoint, contact us. One of our people on the channel team will be more than happy to explain that pricing to you very clearly. And the moment you become a partner, you will get all of the pricing exposed to you uh, in, immediately, effectively. Uh, and if you're a client listening to this um, and you are working with a partner of AppPoint already, uh, you can certainly ask them. They will have access, full access to the pricing of the software. So how about this? What does it take to become a partner? Do I have to uh, pay you guys a, a fee? Do I have to have a, a list of clients? Is there a minimum number of licenses that I have to purchase up front? Or how's the partnership work? Not at all. I mean, uh, if you're on the website already, there's a page where you can sign up to be a partner. Uh, we certainly have different levels. So there is no uh, minimum entry point, as you said, you know, there's no price to pay to get in. There's no number of customers that you have to bring to us uh, just to get in the door. Um, so anybody, uh, you know, with an interest to sell AppPoint products can sign up to be a partner. Now, of course, as you come in, uh, we do have additional levels above that, right? So if you want to sure. be a different level of partner where we actually start to commit to the partner, um, you know, marketing development funds where we can co-invest in marketing activities together, where we could provide you, um, you know, content that you can rebrand and use as your own to advertise and things like that. As you move up the chains of the amount of clients you bring AppPoint, the the amount of um, recurring revenue that you do with AppPoint, uh, you can unlock higher and higher tiers where AppPoint will reinvest back into the partner to help you achieve more sales faster. And of course. Uh, as we mentioned before, any of the MSRP that you'll see listed will also have its own tiering, right? So the more you sell, the more per user cost comes down, and the more AppPoint actually rebates back to you in 
uh, one form or another where it's sales rebates, marketing investments together, lease sharing uh, is another thing that once you sign up as a, as a partner to our portal, our portal is a two-way portal where you can actually uh, register deals, right? We call it deal registration, where you can bring a client to AppPoint and we will lock that in and make sure that, um, you know, no other partner touches that client except for you. And we work with you directly on that client. Uh, and then it goes both ways as you, you know, work with our internal people, our internal sales teams. We can also lease share out to the partner through that same portal as well to, to say, hey, you know, a client has contacted me, for example, for migration. Uh, we think the tool is, is the perfect fit for them, but they're going to need some extra help there, some handholding. Um, things like that, which we're not going to do. So, hey, Mr. Partner, can you go out and contact this customer and see what they need, you know, for migration and what you can offer them? All right. So I know I've got a couple links here when uh, people that are interested in becoming a partner can go to avpoint.com slash partners, and that will that will take them right to the page where they can sign up. Um I really like what I'm hearing about your product. I, I would love to do like a, a deeper dive at some point and have you show it off. Absolutely. Um, now, I, I might get called out by some of my uh, technical counterparts over here to say I'm not going deep enough, but I would love to come back on and spend some time with you, Steve, and maybe grab uh, my CTO or somebody on the product team and show you a little bit more on, on the actual product itself. And um, it's also something that actually... Again, potential partners that are listening, you guys could actually sign up um, to access the, the software, try it out, play around with it as well. And of course, we have a lot of uh, recordings of demos of the product uh, on YouTube, on our website um, that you can check out as well. Do you guys have any like NFR stuff for the MSPs so that way they can play with the software and become more confident and familiar with it? Uh, we do. Again, that's one of the things that you can unlock through the different tiers. Uh, we do have NFRs. Uh, some are less restrictive. Some are more restrictive, again, depending on the, the level of partnership you have. Okay. Wonderful. Tom, is there anything else that you think uh, we need to go over before we wrap up? I mean, one thing I would love to to kind of bring up, I know, um, you know, we spent a lot of, it's, it's been great, by the way, Steve, you know, we, we chatted yeah. a lot. And I think a lot of it is, is, you know, problems we solve or what the technology does. But I think uh, if I may speak kind of to the MSP audience, I think one of the things that oftentimes uh, MSPs forget or partners forget when choosing vendors is really also the company and the support and and all of the things behind the product, right? So even if you do like the product, you're, you're easy, uh, you know, you're easy to use product. Behind that, you need to make sure that there's proper technical support, there's great escalation path because uh, anything in the IT world can go wrong, sometimes do go wrong. And when you're dealing with things like, uh, especially in the world we live in, disaster recovery, migration, a lot of times, a lot of those things are going to happen when you least expect it, right? You don't you don't sit here and you don't plan for disaster recoveries. You don't plan for, for bad things to happen at a specific time. So they could be happening after hours. They could be happening on weekends. So you want to make sure that the vendor that sits behind that product, you know, if it's 3 a.m. on a Sunday morning, could you get somebody on the phone, right? Even if you have the best product and you can't get anybody on the phone, probably not, you know, where you want to be or where you want to invest your, your technology investments because you could be rest assured that the client is going to be screaming at you on the other end at 3 a.m. on a Sunday and you have nobody to call to scream at, right? So I think one thing I'm very proud of beyond our product, of course, is our support. We have true 24 seven support. You can call us 3 a.m. on a Sunday, 3 a.m. on a Monday, Tuesday, whatever. You're always going to get a human being to answer the call. We don't have a robot recording device. Uh, we have 24 seven stream throughout the world. So regardless of what time zone you're in, somebody will always pick up the phone to, to help you. Uh, and of course our, our big support center is actually based right here uh, in the East Coast of the United States in Richmond, Virginia. So you're gonna get a lot of folks uh, right now on the ground in the States in Virginia, answering a lot of those phone calls for you, right? Um, the other side of that, of course, is we hope that again, as great as that support is, we hope you never use it, right? Um, <laughs> Flip side of the coin is also training and enablement. So, you know, I'm proud to say that a lot of our training and enablement and certification that we put out for our partners is quite frankly, the same stuff, same quality that we use internally to train our sales reps. So if you want to learn how to use our product, demo our product, sell our product, you're going to get the same level and quality of training and certification that we would do for our own sales reps, for our own sales engineers, right? We don't, you know, water down the content, so to speak, just because you're not internal. So I think 
those things are really designed to help a a partner not only deliver the best product and service to a client that to make sure that in case anything does go wrong you have an entire weight of app point behind you to support you as well wonderful well tom thank you so much for coming on here today and uh, just educating us about Avpoint. This is a product that I, I'll be honest, I've I've never looked into, and now I I really want to look into more. So uh, please have have like a, a sales engineer or your CTO come on and um, let's do a demo and and show people how easy it is to use this platform and how powerful it can be. That's great. Thank you so much, Steve. I really appreciate the time we spent together. And, and I guess I, I uh, converted a fan and then uh, maybe get you back into uh, disco bowling again. <laughs> hey, absolutely, man. And uh, if, if you ever want to learn how to play the guitar, uh, maybe I can help you out there. So <laughs> oh, that, that's not a bucket list. Maybe we'll have to do, uh, you know, some, some tech exchanges or skills exchange. There you go. All right. Well, hey, you have yourself a good one. And thanks so much for watching the Rocket MSP podcast, everybody. Take care. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, everybody.